in a video game franchise like Resident Evil, you're introduced to a lot of really cool and unique characters. As a matter of fact, it's these characters that really help build up the lore of the franchise and make us fall in love with these stories they tell. With that being said, unfortunately, this is a horror franchise, meaning that there's always a chance that your favorite character could be the next one to bite the bullet. And while it's sad to watch some of these characters go, a character paying the ultimate price sets the tone for these stories and allows us to see how truly emotional these games can get. Which is precisely why on this episode of Nerd Space Games, we are going to take a look at one of the darkest topics I have ever done on this channel. The saddest dying moments in the Resident Evil franchise. First though, if you haven't already, be sure to hit that subscribe button for more ranking videos like this one. Also, help the channel out by hitting that like button. But before we dive down into today's topic, I wanted to set some ground rules. Firstly, I'm only focusing on the mainline games. Also, I'm only looking at the canon endings of each game meaning that I won't be counting something like Rebecca Chambers or Zoe Baker dying. Oh, and one side note, this should be obvious, but big spoiler warning for any and all mainline Resident Evil games. Anyway, my name is Ruben with Nerdspace Games, and this is my top 10 saddest deaths in Resident Evil. Let's get it. Number 10, Deborah Harper, Resident Evil 6. No more tears. Not until I avenge your death. Please. Forgive me. So this might be my weirdest choice for this list, but you know, I love putting a dark horse for my number 10 spot. Anyway, Deborah Harper was the sister of Helena Harper, Leon's partner in Resident Evil 6. Throughout the game, we slowly learned that Helena was forced to betray the President of the United States in order to save her sister. Unfortunately, Derek Simmons, the man behind holding Deborah hostage, had no intention of ever letting Deborah live. Instead, the family used every single opportunity to perform tests on Deborah using this C virus. After carrying out her orders from Simmons, Helena went back to find Deborah only to learn that she had been tortured and infected with the C-Virus. Not long after the reunion, Deborah began her transformation into an unrecognizable monster. After battling with Deborah and multiple failed attempts to bring her sister back, Helena finally realized that her sister was gone and she had to let her go as she fell to her death. Out of all of the characters on this list, Deborah Harper is the one that we've spent the least amount of time with considering we only saw her twice in the game. Once in a flashback scene as she's carried away from her sister and the other being her transformation into the boss that we are forced to fight against. Despite that, she's one of the most tragic losses in the series as her own sister had to be the one to let her die despite giving everything to save her. I mean, I'm not defending Helena at all considering that she caused the death of not only the president of the United States, but the entire town of Tall Oaks. But watching what she had to do to her own sister after sacrificing everything was extremely sad to watch. Number 9, Steve Burnside, Resident Evil, Code Veronica. If you guys know anything about me, then you'll probably know that I'm not a fan of Steve Burnside at all. I think he's obnoxious, irritating, and dumb. But to be fair, he was just a kid. I mean, despite the way he looked, he was only 17 years old during the events of Resident Evil Code Veronica. So knowing how young he truly was, you could probably forgive some of the annoying moments we got with him. Shut up! I don't want to talk about it! Yeah, maybe not all of them. Anyway, Steve was the son of an employee of Umbrella. After his father was caught selling company secrets, he and his father were sent to Rockford Island's prison while his mother was killed. It was during this time that he was separated from his father and then joined Claire as the outbreak began. Eventually, he found his father as a zombie that was attacking Claire and he had to put him down in order to save her. So Steve's backstory is pretty tragic. Unfortunately, it doesn't get much better for him either. Claire and Steve are brought to the Antarctic base where Alexia captures him and injects him with the Veronica virus. Similar to the situation with Deborah Harper, Claire reunites with him just in time to watch him become a monster. Unlike with Deborah, though, we see Steve fight against the infection and ultimately he dies trying to prevent himself from hurting Claire. Steve may have been one of the most annoying characters in the franchise. 
but watching a 17 year old boy die in order to protect a woman that he just met is kind of noble and sad to watch. And considering that we spent a significant amount of time with him throughout the game, it was much more impactful than Deborah's death. Hell, I could even see why people might rank him higher. But then I think about all of the annoying dialogue I had to deal with thanks to him and also that he kind of prevented Claire and him from escaping earlier because he was kind of being a creep. Steve, watch out! Oh no! So yeah, he's lucky he gets number 9 on this list. Number 8, Annette Birkin, Resident Evil 2 Remake. What happened to her? She was attacked by the monster. Don't worry about me. Take my daughter to safety. I'm sorry, Sherry. Everything. Your life is what Shocker, right? We have a villain on this list. I mean, most of the villains of the series deserve what they got, right? So why do I think Annette's death is sad enough to crack this list? Well, honestly, this entry gets a little weird. That's because despite me focusing on the canon ending of each game, Resident Evil 2 is unique. There are moments in both playthroughs that completely contradicts the story especially when dealing with the death of Annette Birkin. So since both playthroughs are technically canon despite not making sense, the version of Annette's death I want to focus on is Claire's scenario. The main reason for this comes down to Annette's character in Claire's playthrough being a little more humane. While we still see that researcher obsessed with her work, we also get to see a mother looking to protect her daughter who also feels regret for everything she has done. We don't really get to see that side of her in Leon's playthrough. Anyway, regardless of which scenario we look at though, Annette finds herself unable to kill William when he injects himself with the G-Virus, thus allowing him and the T-Virus to contaminate Raccoon City. Realizing that she had caused the death of the entire town of Raccoon City, she vows to do what she failed to do earlier, kill her husband. While both versions of Annette see her fatally injured by G Birkin 3 prior to the boss fight, it is in Claire's playthrough where we see a sadder end to her life. Claire volunteers to fight G. Birkin while Annette pushes past her injuries to get to her daughter so that she can save Sherry from the infection. It's here where we see Annette apologize to Sherry for essentially being a bad mother and she dies with regret in her heart for not always being there for her daughter. It's a sad, tragic death for a character that is technically partially responsible for the outbreak of the virus in the first place. However, seeing that redeeming moment from Annette and Sherry's sadness after losing her mother was extremely tough to experience. Of course, Sherry kind of ruins the moment later on though with this comment. Hey, you guys can adopt me. <laughs> adopt uh. <laughs> We can get a puppy. A uh, puppy. What the fuck, Sherry? Your parents literally just died. Number seven, Brad Vickers, Resident Evil 3 Remake. We know how this ends. No, I don't. Are we still a team? Always. Then do me a favor. Go fuck up like I do. Go! I'm not going to waste too much time talking about this, but Resident Evil 3 Remake gets a lot of heat. And I get it. It's not a good remake when you compare it to the original game and you compare it to the treatment that Resident Evil 2 got with its remake. With that being said, I would argue that not everything was worse in the remake. For example, I think we got to see a more noble end for Brad Vickers. In the original Resident Evil 3, Brad Vickers was exactly how he was in the first game, a coward. We find him running away from Nemesis and screaming for Jill to save him. Because of that, we don't really get a sad death from Brad. It's just more so a um, good riddance, I guess. I know that's messed up to say, but when you go back to the Spencer Mansion, this is the same guy that flew away on a chopper because he got too scared. Sure, he waited around to rescue the survivors later, but he still dipped on them in the first place. And to see that he hadn't changed a single bit, yeah, I didn't feel anything when he got killed by Nemesis. With that being said, the remake gave Brad some redemption. After getting bit by a zombie, Brad and Jill tried to hold off a horde of zombies. 
because Brad knew that he was infected anyway, he told Jill to run away while he held off the horde. He gave Jill the opportunity to live and sacrifice himself. Sure, you could argue that he was a dead man anyway, but that shouldn't really take away from the moment, right? I mean, yeah, he was infected, but I'm sure he definitely didn't want to die by being ripped apart by zombies. Yet, he chose that painful end so that his friend could live, therefore somewhat redeeming himself from his actions in the first game. Number 6, Marvin, Resident Evil 2 Remake. Oh, no, I... Just go. Save yourself. Come on, it's bad. We gotta get you to hospital Please, now. Please, Claire. We both know how this is going to end. Get out of the city. I can't just leave you here. Claire, please, go. Do this for me. You've probably noticed by now, but I tend to go with the remakes version of a character's death every single time. That's mainly just because the remakes do a great job at expanding on the side characters. Another example of this is Marvin, the officer that assists both Leon and Claire in Resident Evil 2. In the original, all he pretty much does is give the player a keycard. The next time we see him, he's a zombie. The remake builds on him a lot more. We learn Marvin has been holding down the fort and working with his fellow officers for a way out of the RPD station safely. Our first encounter with him, he even saves Leon or Claire from a horde of zombies trying to pull the player under the shutter door. He also continues to provide assistance to the player leading up to them heading into the secret passage. Unfortunately though, when Leon or Claire return, Marvin has fully changed and become a zombie. But this version allows us to get to know Marvin a little more and allows us to like him more as a character before he fully changes and we have to put him down. Also, side note, Resident Evil 3 Remake shines a light on how Marvin was infected and we get to learn that the guy we just talked about, Brad Vickers, was the one to do it. So uh, I guess so much for Brad redeeming himself, right? Number five, Richard Aiken, Resident Evil Remake. Richard! Chris! Chris, stop! No! Richard. Richard is a Stars Bravo member who was attacked by a giant snake in Resident Evil. As Chris or Jill, the player eventually finds him in pain as the poison begins to kill him. Sadly, Richard will die at some point no matter what you do here. However, saving Richard with the antidote will allow him to do one last noble deed prior to his death. After saving Richard with the antidote, he's able to heal and recover from the poison. Depending on which character you are playing as, Richard will reappear in one of two different areas after healing from his injuries. As Jill, he'll appear during the boss fight against Jan, the same giant snake that bit him. In this fight, he assists Jill with taking it down until it eventually appears to die. However, when Jill lowers her defenses, the Yawn rises again and then attempts to kill Jill. Upon realizing this, Richard, without hesitation, leaps in front of her and sacrifices himself to save his partner. If you are playing as Chris, he'll reappear in the aquatic laboratory under the guardhouse. As Chris enters the room and notices Richard, he walks towards him. Richard, realizing the danger Chris is in, leaps forward and pushes him out of the way in time to be killed by Neptune, a giant shark. Once again, Richard sacrificed himself to save his friend. Richard's loyalty and willingness to sacrifice himself to save his friends showcase how good of a person he was. Despite us not spending too much time with him, I was sad to see him die because of Chris and Jill making a mistake on their end. Not gonna lie, I remember trying to do everything I possibly could to see if there was some way I can save him. But ultimately, no matter what I did, I had to watch him die again and again. Rest in peace, Richard. Number four, Robert and Emma Kendo, Resident Evil 2 Remake. Daddy. Yeah, Daddy's here. Okay. Those fucking things outside. What they did to us. So here we are at number four on this list with a combination of two characters, Robert Kendo and his daughter, Emma. Just like with every other character on this list, the remakes version is the one I want to focus on, mainly because other than providing us with some really brilliant dialogue in the original game, the remakes version is more relatable and better in just about every single way. Sure, Kendo probably spends roughly around the same amount of time on screen as he did in the original game, but the time spent this time around is much more impactful. 
especially thanks to his daughter, Emma. In the remake, we learn Kendo's daughter, Emma, is infected. Despite having the opportunity to escape the town, when his daughter became sick, he decided to stay behind and share her fate. Wanting to spend every last moment with her alone before she dies, Kendo becomes defensive of everybody entering his shop. Hence why he holds Leon up at gunpoint and tells him and Ada to get out of his shop and leave him alone. After Kendo retreats back into a room with his daughter, we hear gunshots where we assume Kendo had taken his own life along with his daughter's life. Kendo's character changes drastically as we now get to see him as a grieving father that must watch his daughter die by his own hands. It's an extremely sad and tragic moment that also finds a way to show us the true extent of what happened to the citizens of Raccoon City. Number 3, Louis Sarah, Resident Evil 4. We're out of that hell The fresh air is sculling our names. For free. Gus, if we made it all this way. You know it means we're almost. <coughs> almost what? <coughs> Louis! The next three on the list are interchangeable. The reason being is that depending on who you like more, you'll probably find yourself ranking their death higher than the other two. As for me with this list, I'm trying to stay as unbiased as possible when ranking them. And for me, Luis Sarah is the first of the three to come up. Now listen, I was devastated at the death of Luis in the first game. He may have come off as a dick, but man was the guy charming as hell. So in the original game, when he spent so much time trying to find a way to help Leon and Ashley, despite barely knowing them, he became someone that I really wanted to survive. Unfortunately, that's not how things played out. Upon bringing Leon and Ashley exactly what they needed, Sadler killed him. However, this is the one time on the list where I put the remakes version tied with the original as both versions were pretty impactful. Similar to the original, Luis once again spends most of his time trying to make up for the bad that he has done by helping Leon and Ashley. The end result though is unfortunately the same but with different circumstances. Instead of Sadler being the one to kill him, Krauser dealt the finishing blow. Now the remake did give Luis one last opportunity to save Leon prior to his death. As Leon was about to be killed by Krauser, Luis shot at him, forcing Krauser to retreat. Here we see one last moment of Luis asking for a smoke for the very last time. Luis is one of the most likable characters in Resident Evil 4. As a matter of fact, there were some fans hoping that Capcom might retcon his death in the remake prior to its release. The remake may have shown a little more of his dark past with Umbrella, but it only built up his character development and his flawed background. Because of his charming personality, his flawed character, and his willingness to redeem himself for all the wrong that he did, Luis will forever go down as one of the greatest one-off characters in the Resident Evil franchise. Number 2, Pierce Nivens, Resident Evil 6. Here we go, Pierce. We're getting out of here. Oh my god, this is where people are going to fight tooth and nail with me about this character and the other character that takes number one spot. Anyway, Pierce Nivens is a very interesting one, and I'm sure a lot of fans will probably put him as their number one. There are multiple different reasons that watching Pierce die was rough and hard on us as fans. For one, Pierce was arguably the best part of Resident Evil 6. When you compare him to all of the new characters in the game, he was the one that stood out the most. He was pretty much the angel on the shoulder of Chris Redfield, helping him find his path again and become the Boy Scout that we used to know him as in previous games. Add that to the fact that Pierce was kind of set up to be the future of the franchise, and you are a little bit more devastated that he dies. He was someone that had a kind heart who was always willing to do the right thing. Then the worst happened. Pierce was fatally injured and had to use the C-Virus to help Chris escape the facility. Once they reached the escape pods, Pierce knew what he had to do. Instead of escaping with Chris, Pierce pushed him into the pod and sent Chris to the surface. Heos, the final boss of Chris's campaign, came rushing to the surface after Chris, but we saw one last move made by Pierce as he used his abilities to stop Heos and allow Chris to stay alive. I can't tell you how much I teared up during this scene when Chris tried to stop Pierce from leaving him. The sadness in Chris's voice was heartbreaking and watching Pierce make that sacrifice was rough considering that I fell in love with this character that appeared to be the future of the franchise. Pierce was also the motivation that Chris needed to continue his fight against the B.O.W.s. His sacrifice led to Chris still fighting B.O.W.s in Resident Evil 7 and Village. 
Hell, we still know that Chris is with the BSAA even 16 years after the events of Village. Yeah, that same guy that said he was done fighting is still fighting thanks to his time with Pierce. We even see Pierce mentioned in Resident Evil Death Island by Chris. It's obvious that the guy played a huge part in helping Chris become the man that we see in the future titles of the Resident Evil franchise, like Resident Evil Village. So it's kind of hard not to put him at the number one spot. But ultimately, there was one death that hit me just a little bit harder than Pierce's death. Number one, Ethan Winters, Resident Evil Village. Keep moving, Ethan. There's a bomb in that thing that'll blow this whole village sky high. Hey, look at me. When I hit this trigger, we can't be anywhere near it. Ah, damn it. Me is waiting for you. She's alive, you hear me? Alive. Mia, I'm so sorry. I love you. Keep Rose safe. Hey, hey. Uh, hey. Uh, uh, and you tell yourself. Now, oh, come on, it's not that much further. Watch over her. Teach her to be strong. Goodbye, Rosemary. Ethan Winters is a character that is very divisive with the Resident Evil fan base. The main reason for that comes down to the games that he appeared in, Resident Evil 7 and Village. Some fans didn't like the direction of where Capcom went with its storytelling and gameplay as it introduced mythical creatures of folklore, shape-shifting monsters, and supernatural abilities. Add that to the first-person perspective and the fact that Ethan Winters became a faceless character essentially, some fans just did not connect with him. Still, Ethan Winters was built as a character that could be relatable to just about any player of his games, both new and old gamers of the franchise. That was because Ethan, on paper, was just a regular man looking to protect his family. In Resident Evil 7, we see Ethan give everything for a small chance of finding his wife who has been missing for three years. Despite just being a normal guy, he battles through molded creatures, a supernatural-like demon girl, and a family of monsters in order to save his wife, Mia. Of course, it didn't work out as well as we had initially thought, but that's not really important right now. What is important, though, is that after the events of Resident Evil 7, we see Ethan once again go through hell to save his family this time to save his new daughter, Rose. He battles through possessed dolls, vampires, and even a baby monster to then learn that he technically died back in Resident Evil 7. Still, even as they molded, we were attached to Ethan and his goal to save Rose no matter the cost. And the cost was high for Ethan. After finally rescuing his daughter, he realizes that he needs to sacrifice himself to keep Mother Miranda from catching up to his daughter and taking her again. So he pays the ultimate price. The tragic ending to Ethan's story is even more impactful than most on this list because of how long we've been with Ethan. Unlike most Resident Evil characters that died, Ethan was the main character of back-to-back -back games. He wasn't some side character that was killed. This was the character that we as the player played as for the past two titles of the series. So watching Ethan pay the ultimate price for his daughter was tough and hard for us to watch. Add that to the tearful final goodbye moment that he has with Rose in the DLC for Village, and you can easily see why I believe he's truly the saddest death of the Resident Evil franchise. I know there are so many people out there that I didn't talk about. People like Mikhail, Clancy, and even Mike the helicopter pilot. So let me know if you think I made the right choice with Ethan Winters as my number one pick, or do you think someone else should have been number one? Anyway, if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe for more ranking videos like this one, especially if you love Resident Evil, Silent Hill, and other survival horror content. But thanks for watching, and as always, I'll catch you guys on the next episode of Nerdspace Games. Take care.